Thank you for joining today's second online general membership meeting of the Management Association of the Philippines. My name is Rex Drulon, and I'm your MC today uh, for the MAP GMM on leveling the playing field amid the COVID-19 pandemic with uh, Chairman uh, Balisakan as our guest of honor. Please settle down comfortably. We will now begin our program. May I request everyone to pause and bow your heads for a short prayer. Or you may wish to stand, and if you do, after the invocation, please remain standing for the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Lord, for all who have contracted COVID-19, we pray for care and healing. For those who are particularly vulnerable, we pray for safety and protection. For all who express fear and anxiety, we pray for peace of mind and spirit. For affected families who are facing difficult decisions between food on the table or public safety, we pray for policies that recognize their plight. And for those who do not have adequate health insurance, we pray that no family will face financial burdens alone. For our brothers and sisters around the world, we pray for shared solidarity. For public officials and decision makers, we pray for wisdom and guidance. Father, during this time, may your church be a sign of hope, comfort, and love to all. Grant peace, grant comfort, grant healing. Be with us, Lord. Amen. Amen. And let us pause for a moment to pray for the eternal repose of the MAP Membership Committee Co-Vice Chair Grace Palmachonko, President of First Credit Consultants Corporation, who passed away on May 15 at the age of 60. Amen. <clears throat> Let us now place our right hand on our chest and joining us and join us in the singing of the Philippine National Anthem. <laughs> Mga kababayan, ang pambansang awit ng Pilipinas. Ayang magiliw, kaya saksihan alam, alam ng puso sa hindi ko ibubay. Upang pinihinaw, kaya ka nang mahihiting, sa pandulupin, hindi ka masisigil. Take your seats. And at this point, may I request the president of MAP, who is the senior partner and exco member of Acura Law, Attorney Francis Lim, to deliver the welcome remarks. Francis. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Rex. Good afternoon to everyone. Good afternoon. Um, I hope that you and your families are continue to be healthy and safe while we are on a modified ECQ. On behalf of the MAP Board of Governors, I welcome all of you to the second online general, general membership meeting of the MAP. Many thanks to our speaker, Philippine Competition Chairman Arsenio Arce Balisacan, who will enlighten us on leveling the playing field amid the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Special thanks also to the MAP East of Doing Business Committee, Chair Tammy Lipana, Vice Chair Alma Jimenez, Governing Chair Sait Tanko, and Committee Member Rex Drilon for helping us put together this second online MAP GMM. I understand that there are 200 registrants today, and this far exceeds the 200 or so we had in our first online GMM. The COVID-19 pandemic makes it difficult for us from fully pursuing our lead agenda. But it has stopped us from helping our members cope with the problems and concerns brought about by the pandemic. As many of you already know, we have been conducting COVID-19 related webinars. We have conducted four webinars and two online GMMs including today's event, within the past seven weeks that discuss areas of concern brought about by the pandemic. The list of the MAP organized webinars are now flashed on the screen for your reference. On top of these MAP organized webinars, we have partnered with other organizations like the Business World, FinTech, PASHA, Sherfield and the PCCI to deliver topics of interest to our members. The lists are likewise flashed now on the screen. Please note that some of the webinars are still to be held in the future. In fact, one of them will be held this afternoon at 2 p.m. today, where I will be one of the reactors. Please watch out for the uh, announcements on these webinars and take time to join them as they may discuss topics that may be of interest to you and your businesses. <clears throat> your organization has also been busy on other COVID-related fronts. As you know, we have conveyed to the IATF our strong objection to the exclusion of the elderly, and I'm referring to the 60 years old and over, from going to ba back to work post-ECQ. You now know that the ITF approved guidelines allow the elderly to go back to work. We have likewise submitted a modified transport plan to the ITF addressed to the attention of Secretary Tugade, and I hope that it will be considered soon instead of requiring employees to hire shuttle buses, which definitely is an added cost to doing business. Thanks to our Transportation Committee, chaired by Rui Moreno for this initiative. We have likewise been giving our inputs to the proposed Philippine Stimulus Act, Economic Stimulus Act or PESA bill, and push hard for them. Foremost of these are the following. The transfer of government funded infrastructure projects to the private sector under the PPP program in order to free up government funds to finance the projects under the stimulus law and at the same time create business opportunities for the business sector. Number two, relaxation of the rules implementing the BOT law to make the PPP attractive to investors and speed up government infrastructure projects. Number three, beefing up the funds of the Philippine Guarantee Corporation or Phil Guarantee and the revival of the Special Purpose Vehicles Act and the relaxation of its rules in order to encourage the banking industry to continue lending to the business sector. Number four, easing the regulations that only at the national level but also at the LGU level pursuant to our ease of doing business agenda. Lastly, but not the least, MSM, MMS incentive provisions to help our small businesses recover from the pandemic. Examples of these are the preferential guarantee to be given by, by field guarantee for MSME loans. I'm happy to report that these provisions, which we push hard to be included, are now part of the PESA bill submitted to the plenary for consideration and I, we hope that they will be included in the final version of the law. We were informed, no less than, by Congressman Sharon Barin, 
chair of the Economic Affairs Committee, that as of last night, there are 207, 207 congressmen who are signing the PEP sign or are signing the substitute bill as co-authors. The substitute bill drawn up by Economic Affairs Committee Chair Sharon Garin consolidated the two bills separately filed by Congressman Joey Salceda and Congresswoman Stella Kimbo. What the 207 signatures mean is that it is, a highly, it is highly probable that the House of Representatives will pass the first bill as the co-authors constitute around two-thirds of the entire membership of the House. Let's keep our fingers crossed. I would also like to inform the membership that because of our inability to hold physical or actual GMMs, we have requested our new members to submit their sign-off of membership in lieu of actual induction in the GMA. This year, we have already admitted 30 new members and we're following up the sign off of membership of 79 new members, which will bring up our new members this year to 109. We will continue working for new members. At yesterday's meeting, the board approved the proposed map covenant for shared prosperity, which basically shows that MAP members care not only for their businesses, but more importantly, for the other stakeholders of our economy. Thanks to the National Issues Committee for spearheading this covenant. We will circulate the covenant in due time and encourage our members to sign it. Under the covenants, members who sign commit to do the things now flash on the screen. Last but not least, we held last Monday, May 18, jointly with Phoenix, a mass and memorial service for MAP members of committee vice, co vice chair Grace Palmatyonko, who unexpectedly left us on May 15. We will surely miss her dedication and passion to the MAP. Please continue praying for the eternal repose of her soul. In closing, thank you one and all for joining today's online GMM. And thank you, especially Chair Arcibalisakan, for participating and sharing your time with us. Keep well, everyone, and enjoy the GMM. Thank you, and mabuhay ang MAP. Thank you, Mr. President Francis, for updating us with uh, what has been happening in the last few weeks and uh, for a very active uh, MAP board in spite of the uh, lockdown. Uh, some reminders, please, before we start the presentation and the discussion, I'd like to emphasize the following important house rules. First, as participants for this online GMM, we would like to inform you that you're automatically muted and your camera or video was also turned off automatically. Please submit your questions through the Q&A button that you see on your screen. With the assistance of the MAP Secretariat, I will read the questions on your behalf. For your information, you'll only be able to see the speaker and his presentation, but you will not be able to view the other participants. And lastly, at any point during this online GMM, in case you lose connection, please join again by repeating what you did earlier in logging in. In line with the MAP policy, we will dispense with the lengthy introduction of our guest speaker. And, but since we, have, we are ahead of schedule, I'd like to say something about the legacy of our guest of honor to our country and to our people when he was still the Secretary of Economic Planning and NEDA Director General. In 2014, under the direction then of Secretary Balisakan, NEDA conducted a survey about what the aspirations are of the Filipinos for himself and for his country. This research project took two years to finish. They interviewed more than 10,000 Filipinos in all the provinces of 
the country in Luzon, besides in Mindanao, men and women, rich and poor, young and old, farmers, fishermen, blue collar and white collar workers, professionals, businessmen, etc. In short, a microcosm of the Philippine society. The result was an incredible document called Ambition 2040, the vision of the Filipino for himself and for his country, which was articulated as follows. The vision of the Filipino for himself. By the year 2040, we will all enjoy a stable and comfortable lifestyle, securing the knowledge that we have enough for our daily needs and expected expenses, that we plan and prepare for our own and our children's future. Our family lives together in a place of our own, yet we have the freedom to go where we desire and enabled by a clean, efficient, and fair government. Very clear aspiration of the Filipino for himself. What about the vision of the Filipino for, for his country? He said, by 2040, the Philippines shall be a country where all citizens are free from hunger, poverty, have equal opportunities, enabled by a fair and just society that is governed with order and unity. A nation where families live together, thriving in vibrant, culturally diverse and resilient communities. A beautiful articulation of our dream Philippines. When former Secretary Ernie Pernia spoke before the MAP right after he took office as the new Secretary of Economic Planning and NEDA Director General, he was asked whether he would push for the ambushed Ambition 2040 crafted as his predecessor. He promised MAP he would, and he did. And in October 2016, President Duterte issued Executive Order Number 5, mandating all government agencies, the NGAs, the LGUs, and GOCCs, to align all of their strategies for the long term to Ambition 2040. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest of honor today is the father of Ambition 2040. For this, Chairman Balisakan, the, country's, the country owes you one. May I now call on our speaker for his presentation today, and let us welcome the Chairman of the Philippine Competition Commission, or PCC, Chairman R.C. Balisakan. Please unmute, please unmute, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the very kind introduction, Rex. Uh, MAP President Francisco Lim, friends from the business community, colleagues and friends from the media who are joining us in this online discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I thank the Management Association of the Philippines for this different from usual opportunity to humbly share with the business community my thoughts on the role that the Philippine Competition Commission, or PCC, is and will be playing to ensure a level playing field for businesses during these trying times. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic has placed the world in a state of unprecedented uncertainty. It has appended the lives of many and has created far-reaching and long-lasting ramifications on almost all fronts, particularly the state of public health and the economy. The resulting productivity losses, supply chain disruptions, labor dislocation, and potential financial pressure on businesses and households will undoubtedly alter the global economic fabric in the months in even years to come. Given this situation, you might ask, is competition policy still relevant at this time and under these extreme circumstances? The simple and straightforward answer is yes, now and more than ever. Why? First, the supply and demand shocks due to the pandemic 
may present firms with an incentive to change their usual behavior, exploit the situation. Business strategies that worked before may no longer enable them to maintain their desired profit margins. To avoid losses, some firms might resort to employing extraordinary means, including anti-competitive behavior, such as cartel activity and abuse of dominance. We know that anti-competitive behavior will exacerbate the already significant economic losses that have been incurred. It will also worsen the plight of consumers because anti-competitive anti conduct leads to higher prices, diminished choices, and lack of access to essential goods. Second, there are longer term dynamics that have to be considered. The economy's ability to grow in the medium to long term will be either aided or constrained by the policy choices and responses made during the crisis. Thus, these policies must be carefully crafted so that they can be removed when they are no longer needed. Otherwise, they may lead to un unintended consequences of lessening competition and distorting market structures, therefore hurting long-term prospects for innovation, growth, and consumer welfare. Competition policies to be a useful com complementary policy lever for a recovering e economy. A recovery that is anchored on competitive processes will build a robust foundation for sustained and inclusive growth. The Philippine economy faces risk and uncertainties not seen in recent decades. The economy weathered comparatively well the Asian financial crisis of 1997-1998 and the global economic crisis of 2008-2009. But those crises did not have the complication of health dynamics. The coronavirus is still evolving. And until a cure is found or a vaccine is developed and made accessible, uncertainties continue. Although necessary, the transmission control measures of various country governments, including those employed by the Philippine government, have disrupted national and global, global supply chains and depressed demand. This pandemic has radically changed the game, and we are unsure what patterns of recovery or economy is going to take. Across countries, the patterns would look very different depending partly on their demographic characteristics, institutions, including health governance, and policy responses to pandemic or to the pandemic. Notably, an optimistic projection is V-shaped, suggesting that whatever was not consumed or produced during the pandemic is foregone, but that the economy will go back to the no pandemic trajectory. Our country is aiming for this type, type of recovery. But a U-shape or a SUS recovery cannot be discounted. In this case, the pandemic's effects and economic activity will linger even without social distancing. And the growth recover, recovers uh, slowly. If the first round of openings would be followed by a resurgence of cases and another round of lockdowns, the recovery may well be double shaped in the next year, we may still see the global economy affected by drastic changes that COVID-19 has introduced via supply and demand shocks. Countries may continue to trade less as critical nodes or hubs have been severely affected by these shocks. Given these extreme circumstances, our good macroeconomic fundamentals and the lessons we have gained from past crises are not enough to get us out of the slump. To achieve an inclusive post-pandemic development, we need a relief and program based firmly on compassion for the poor and highly vulnerable groups and a level playing field for businesses. Let's examine 
quickly where the regional and Philippine economists are heading this year. Growth is expected to decline sharply in East and East Asia and the Pacific. The Philippines GDP growth unexpectedly fell to a negative territory, as we all know, in the first quarter, and will likely stay there in the next two to three quarters. Different institutions have downgraded their GDP growth forecast for the country. The most optimistic estimates, which was given before the lockdown, is 3%. Many other institutions predict a lower rate with a lower bound at around minus 5 to minus 7%. The Government's Development Budget Coordination Committee, or DBCC, projects that the economy will shrink by 2 to 3.4%. 3 which is at the median of the other forecast. Nonetheless, all of these projections compare unfavorably to the no pandemic growth scenario forecast of around 6%. How do governments caution against the negative economic effects caused by the pandemic? In other words, how do governments minimize trade, -off, trade offs between lives and livelihood? Countries have been adjusting both their health and macroeconomic policies to flatten the pandemic curve. Many governments have implemented lockdowns and travel restrictions. In parallel, to flatten the recession curve, governments are taking monetary, fiscal, and structural measures. Fiscal and monetary policies through transfers and injections of liquidity into the economy have been deployed to counter the effects of the pandemic and the supply and demand sides. Although expansionary, macroeconomic policy will be less effective in increasing production and employment with the required social distancing and mobility restrictions. It still plays a critical role in, the reco in recovery. Most governments have given social protection to households, especially the most economically vulnerable. Expanded safety nets and cash and in-kind transfers have provided temporary relief to families whose earnings have been adversely affected, some completely wiped out by the outbreak. Firms, especially small and medium enterprises, have been given liquidity injections to help them stay in business. Most governments have helped businesses in the form of loan guarantees, deferral of tax and social contributions, debt relief for the press borrowers, and subsidies to maintain employment. With these policy measures or responses, governments are hoping to prevent a temporary shock from having permanent effects on the business environment. To avoid financial instability, central banks have cut monetary policy rates, lowered reserve requirements, and engaged in asset purchases. They have also exercised regulatory forbearance and flexibility. These have helped households to smooth consumption through easier access to credit and firms to survive the disruption through easier access to liquidity. The biggest health and economic crisis to befall the Philippines in recent decades necessitates a robust full of government response. Guided by the imperative to advocate policies that support the overall welfare of Filipinos in these critical times, PCC supports the enactment of laws geared toward reviving and stimulating the national economy. To strengthen health policy responses to COVID-19 COVID and to ensure that Filipinos have the resources to survive these difficult times, the government's economic team has proposed the Philippine Program for Recovery with Equity and Solidarity, or FAITS Das Progreso for sure. This program comprises three stages, emergency stage, recovery stage, and resiliency stage. To respond to the emergency stage, the Bayanihan to Heal as One Act was passed. This law has granted the president special powers to address the COVID-19 outbreak in the country. Examples of direct policy responses to the rise of COVID-19 cases our budget and procurement flexibility for essential goods, as well as equipment and financial support for the frontliners. To mitigate the immediate economic consequences to consumers and businesses, 
the government provided emergency cash aids, lowered interest rates and reserve requirements, and extended deadlines for taxes and, pay, uh, uh, and payments. For a longer-term policy response in the recovery stage, several economic stimulus proposals have been put forward in the executive branch as well as in the legislative branch. The PH does progress as proposed policy response during the recovery stage will be executed under Bayanihan II and the Corporate Recovery and Tax Incentives for Enterprises Act, or CREATE, for short. The first phase of the recovery plan includes credit guarantees in a wage subsidy program for small and medium enterprises and a targeted equity support for large firms. The second phase includes the reduction of the corporate income tax or income tax rate from the current 30% to 25%. The third phase involves funding for projects meant to improve the healthcare system and the agriculture sector, as well as for infrastructure projects in the build, build, build program. Several economic stimulus, uh, stimulus bills are now pending in Congress. And I'm glad to hear that uh, MAP has also been active in its advocacy and, and stimulus bills. Allow me to briefly go over the most comprehensive one, which was also discussed by President uh, Francis. The Philippine Economic Stimulus Bill, or PESA for sure, includes wage subsidies, regulatory relief for businesses, loans to firms, including micro, small, and medium enterprises, equity acquisitions by the government through the creation of the National Emergency Investment Corporation, and a programmed infrastructure spending. These interventions aim to mitigate losses in sectors most affected by the crisis. As a part of the resiliency stage and because of limited resources, the Philippine government has been realigning its 2020 budget and taking loans to fund the policy responses to COVID-19. It has adjusted its fiscal program for the next three years, reducing expected collections and increasing disbursements, which constitutes or constitute more than a fifth of the GDP. As these programs are rolled out, it is crucial to recognize several risks to the competition landscape brought on by the conditions under the pandemic and by the unintended consequences that these initiatives may create. To be sure, the health and economic crisis would have both short-term and long-term effects on competition. In the short term, we may see firms exhibiting a pricing behavior different from that in normal times. When profits are down, collusive or other forms of anti-competitive behavior that attempt to exploit crisis conditions to raise prices are more likely. Price fixing and bid rigging are examples of such and that. To limit price surges, some jurisdictions have already imposed price caps or price ranges. However, governments should use price controls with caution. Imposing price ceilings may be counterproductive since they may deter the entry of other firms to produce more goods, especially essential goods. Additionally, price pegs may function as reference points for pollution even after the lifting of price controls. During times of crisis, opportunities for cooperation are sought to solve supply shortages, especially of essential goods. Indeed, undertaking temporary joint R&D activities, coordinating production or sharing distribution facilities can improve efficiency in the production and distribution of essential goods. The resulting additional quantity of goods and the corresponding lower prices are beneficial for consumers. However, there is a significant risk that cooperation might spill over to hardcore restrictions like price fixing, since competitors may then regularly obtain information on the other firms' inventories and pricing strategies. Price fixing or output fixing is welfare reducing because it artificially sets the prices higher or output lower. Furthermore, if information exchange is enabled between firms, it is highly likely that their coordination will be preserved 
even after the crisis, after establishing contact focal points and sharing business processes, competitors will find it easier to cooperate in the future and make decisions that will jointly maximize their profits. This is cartel behavior and is prohibited under the law. The impacts of disruptions in supply and chains, in supply chains and demand conditions are expected to linger beyond the pandemic. Losses and uncertainty will lead to market uh, exits of firms, especially the smaller ones. There will also be increased appetite for mergers and rescue mer mergers as firms attempt to recover and strengthen their market positions during and after the crisis. The resulting increase in market concentration as failing firms exit or as firms merge may lead to monopolization or substantially raise market power, possibly giving rise to harm to consumers if such market power comes with the ability and incentive to exercise that market power in the form of higher prices, lower quality of goods and services, or less innovation. To avoid or mitigate the impact of short-term and medium-term implications of the COVID-19 crisis on market conduct and market structure, it is crucial to apply the competition lens to government policy responses. Almost all of these measures, subsidies, bailouts, and nationalizations, price controls, cooperation of, of competitors and mergers, come with the associated risk of distorting the playing field for businesses. This risk can be mitigated, however, through competitive solutions. Through competitive solutions. For example, subsidies, if not carefully crafted, can be both ad hoc and selective, thereby distorting the playing field of businesses within and among different industries. To avoid this consequence, the state, state aids need to be based on objective criteria, clear and transparent rules, and applicable to all businesses within an industry, not skewed towards select businesses or firms. Furthermore, Support measures should be time-bound to reduce the risk of rent-seeking behavior and to ensure that undistorted market dynamics will produce competitive outcomes in the long run. As the country's competition ad advocate and champion, PCC strives to inject the competition lens in the crafting of policies that may affect market competition. To ensure a level playing field, that protects both consumers and producers, PCC continues to strictly enforce the Philippine Competition Act. It stands vigilant and constantly monitor the market through different channels to guard against breaches of the competition law. Hardcore restrictions like price fixing and bid rigging will be actively prosecuted and duly penalized. The Bayanihan Act also enforces measures to protect the people from cartels, monopolies, and other combinations in the restraints of trade, affecting the supply, distribution, and, and movement of essential goods and services. Enabled by Memoranda of Agreement, PCC and the Department of Trade and Industry, as well as the Department of Justice, have established enforcement support on detecting and prosecuting firms that are taking advantage of the current situation particularly on the supply and prices of essential goods. Our guidelines on merger processes and timelines, timelines have been responsive to the mobility and health restrictions placed by the government during the pandemic. Since May 18 this week, our mergers and acquisitions office have resumed to accept notification forms and letters of non-coverage, this time through online filing. We also waive the 30-day compulsory notification period. These guidelines will last for the duration of the extended enhancement community quarantine. Given the expected increase in the consolidation of firms, PCC maintains its proactive stance with respect to merger control. History has proven time and time again that unchecked consolidation leads to coordinated conduct and a rise in market power. 
as this crisis is hoped to be temporary, the sharp rise in concentration within industries may create greater harm to consumers in the longer run. It should be noted that mergers and acquisitions that use failing firms uh, defense to justify consolidation should meet the standard of proof stipulated in the PCA. Before clearing these types of M&As, PCC will carefully analyze the transactions to mitigate risk and avoid long-lasting negative impacts on the structure and dynamics of markets. We will continue to exercise due diligence in our merger reviews, especially of transactions that might lead the sector being controlled by one or a few dominant entities. PCC advocates the use of the competition lens in the crafting of national government's interventions. While the objective is to protect jobs and ameliorate suffering of the vulnerable groups in the short run, it is crucial that these interventions avoid introducing distortions and creating an uneven playing field. Failing to do this will be detrimental in the medium term, medium to long term. These efforts to inject competition in the whole government is embodied in the national competition policy, which serves as a framework that would steer state policies and administrative regulations toward the promotion of robust and fair market competition. It rests on three fundamental pillars. One, effective implementation of the Philippine Competition Act. Two, enactment of pro-competitive regulations or government regulations. And three, internalization of the principles of competitive neutrality. This brings me back to the point on the role of clear and transparent rules that are guided by the principles of healthy and effective competition. Misguided interventions may cause market distortions and create an uneven playing field, unduly protecting failing or inefficient firms. By applying the competition lens, policies and state aid can enhance economic efficiency through proper allocation of scarce resources to critical sectors that need stimuli for production or innovation. Proactive competition advocacy will be especially potent in significantly improving the present and future landscape faced by businesses and consumers. The matter of mainstreaming sound competition principles has taken on a greater sense of urgency in a COVID-19 disrupted world, where the economy's swift recovery matters more than ever. PCC has actively put forward its position and provided inputs whenever Congress requests an analysis of the competitive effects of certain legislations. For example, the Commission expressed its support for the Philippine Economic Stimulus Bill, or PESA, to keep the economy afloat amid global uncertainty. In our position on this bill, we re recommended that the provision on wage subsidies be recalibrated so that it will be more equitable to and inclusive of smaller firms. We also advise we, uh, to maintain strict regulation over natural monopolies, to avoid possible abuse of market power, to promote transparent and non-discriminatory access to subsidies, and to exercise caution in the consolidation of troubled businesses. Next week, our Legislative Liaison Office will conduct a seminar for the House Legislative Staff to advocate the use of competition principles in crafting laws. Through these inputs, we hope to instill the competition perspective and foster a deeper appreciation for sound competition principles among our legislators. As we transition to the new normal, PCC will continue to actively monitor markets and provide evidence-based guidance and policy interventions during the recovery period. <coughs> and, so, excuse me. and so, to the question, is competition policy relevant during this current period or current health and economic crisis? 
the answer is a resounding yes. Competition law is relevant during the pandemic and becomes even more so during the recovery period as you work together to build a resilient and inclusive economy. The design of policy responses to the crisis, relief, recovery, resiliency, needs to be mindful of risk and pro-competitive solutions. This is to avoid the unintended consequences of weakening competitive processes and distorting market structures that harm consumers' welfare and the country's prospects for sustained and inclusive growth. Again, let me assure you that as we transition to the new normal, PCC will remain vigilant in market monitoring, enforcement, and evidence-based advocacy. This ensure that consumer welfare is protected, that businesses are playing fairly, and that government interventions are pro-competitive. An equal playing field during and post-pandemic will ensure a faster and more stable economic recovery. As I end this talk, let me enjoin you, members of the business community, to be our partners and champions for competition, especially in these trying times. Let us work together in complying with the competition law and PCC processes, in competing fairly with rivals in the market, and in building a robust culture of competition in the Philippines. Together, as we heal as, we heal as one, we can steer the economy back to its high growth trajectory. Thank you and a pleasant day to all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a very enlightening presentation. And we are now ready for the Q&A. As I mentioned earlier, please submit your questions through the Q&A button on your screen. Uh, due to the time constraints, MAP members will not be given the opportunity to, to speak. So let me start with my old question. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a few weeks ago, we read in media uh, the report that uh, San Miguel Group is withdrawing from the purchase of whole seam, uh, cement. Uh, and the reason that was reported in media was that uh, it has taken uh, PCC more than a year to process the application. What's your take on that, Mr. Chair? Oh, thank you. Uh, let me point out that our statutory uh, uh, rules provide for uh, thirty days for the uh, uh, thirty days for the phase one uh, review and sixty days for the phase two review. Now, uh, in the case of uh, uh, the, the the SMSC whole sim uh, transaction, uh, the, the the parties. Uh, themselves requested several times for for waiver uh, uh, in an effort to to uh, satisfy the requirements of our uh, mergers uh, mergers office particularly the request for uh, information uh, there are several of those uh, requests uh, and so every time they request they ask for a waiver of the uh, period mm -hmm. and then um, when the uh, uh, our mergers office uh, finally uh, uh, submitted to the commission a uh, its a statement of concern, uh, the parties uh, submitted to us uh, to the commission voluntary commitments, and that again uh, uh, meant a, a waiver uh, uh, that, that the parties would have to ask for uh, or submit a waiver and. The negotiations uh, and those undertakings uh, 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 you still hear me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so th those negotiations, uh, the negotiation of, of this the undertaking takes uh, again a uh, long time. Um, uh, they submitted uh, twice, but uh, eventually uh, the, the the commissions uh, decided that uh, uh, the the uh, the submissions uh, the proposals of the of the uh, parties uh, do not meet the, or do not uh, completely address the concerns competition concerns of uh, of uh, the, the uh, 
uh, stated in the statement of concerns of the of Mao, our uh, mergers office. So we eventually uh, rejected the uh, undertaking, and uh, and then we proceeded to, uh, and that meant that we would now have to resume the phase two review of the uh, of uh, the transaction, uh, and and we only had a few days left actually to render uh, the decision, decision when when uh, government. Uh, already issued, uh, you know, when pandemic strikes and the government issued this administrative order suspending proceedings in quasi-judicial bodies like us. And so, yeah, uh, that's how it, 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 it got held, uh, it got delayed. But then again, uh, the, the decision as to whether they, uh, they cancel their, uh, their may or they, uh, they, it's their option to, to uh, 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 what, what's this? To, to delay, to, to um, um, revise their uh, closure terms uh, because they have they agreed to close their transaction uh, on May t May ten. Of course, they 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 could have also uh, negotiated to have that uh, delayed in view of the uh, pandemic uh, because agencies anyway cannot uh, render their. Uh, their uh, uh, or are limited in their uh, abilities to uh, uh, perform their uh, their mandates given the crisis. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Arnold, how do we uh, view the other questions? From your Q and A button, Mr. Rex, press the Q and A okay. button. Uh, let, okay, we have already a lot of questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first question uh, from Noel Bunuan. Do you foresee companies doing more mergers and acquisitions, especially if the merger acquired company faces bankruptcy? If so, will PCC take a more lenient approach to allowing these mergers, even if the results in the acquirer being more dominant? Uh, the... the um the conditions, uh, 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 or let me put it this way, uh, the Philippine Competition Act um, has provisions and failing firms. Um, and um, uh, to state it briefly, it simply says that uh, uh, mergers and acquisitions involving uh, failing firms, uh, to the extent that it would... Uh, increased uh, uh, market concentration or increased market power, and that has attendant uh, cost to, to consumers if uh, such increase in market power will result in, uh, uh, in the ability and in, uh, in the incentives to exercise that market power. Uh, as opposed to uh, the efficiency uh, uh, gains that uh, result from such uh, uh, acquisition. Um, now, uh, if the gains are, are, are uh, uh, better, are, uh, if the benefits are higher than the cost, uh, uh, that's allowed. But that, again, that's for the parties, merging parties to, uh, uh, to show, uh, to demonstrate. Uh, and also that the, um, uh, the, 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 the loss also says that there must be no other more superior alternative. If there is another alternative, if there is a, a another buyer, for example, of that uh, losing firm, and not uh, and not just uh, uh, this buyer that uh, who may happen to be already the dominant uh, firm, then that is a uh, something that uh, is not as straightforward as it looks. Okay, uh, from Cora Claudio, uh, Mr. Chairman, what preparatory program or system are we we including in the resiliency stage for major environmental risks that we now face, such as adverse climate changes, potentially big earthquakes, more volcanic eruptions that will surely have a big negative impact on public health and our autonomy. Uh, sorry, I, I, it's, it, it, it's a what, bit choppy. And, uh, uh, what, what's the question again? Sorry. What 
repertory program or systems are we including, are you including in the resiliency stage okay. for major environmental risks, such as climate change, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions that will surely have a big impact on public health and our economy? Uh, resiliency program. Uh, I thought that you are asking about competition issues. Uh, 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 okay, uh, of course, uh, the, the, uh, uh, I, I mentioned about the PH dash uh, trabajo uh, uh, plan of our program earlier, and uh, that is supposed to uh, still flesh uh, out its uh, resiliency program. Uh, uh, as part of the uh, uh, of the recovery uh, uh, leading to um, uh, resiliency uh, now but of course from uh, the, uh, the viewpoint of, of my, at least from my own perspective coming from uh, uh, from the research community from the academic community myself uh, uh, the way I see it and uh, is that uh, uh, we need to uh, uh, to, to be very more aggressive in, in innovations that are appropriate for our local uh, environments. We are a country that's so different, uh, very different from, uh, from many of our neighbors. Uh, we're an archipelagic country, uh, very vulnerable to all kinds of stresses, uh, particularly climate change, and yet, uh, the kind of technologies or, or, or processes that you uh, that you see uh, and are available out there uh, may not be transferable to to uh, or applicable appropriate for our own particular settings. A good example is, for example, uh, is agricultural technologies, uh, new varieties or new crops or, or new uh, species of animals. Now, uh, our uh, uh, geography is such that uh, those new varieties would have to be uh, adaptable to each of these uh, 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 environments. I remember when I was at the Department of Agriculture uh, some, um, almost two decades already, uh, and, and there was this uh, program to bring in uh, new high-yielding varieties of rice from China Okay, so we brought those high yielding rice varieties of China, but we never tested them uh, in the in the actual fields of farmers. And obviously, <coughs> and so why while these new varieties yielded seven to ten tons per hectare in China, they hardly made two tons or three tons in the Philippines. And we never <laughs> made the effort to to find out what's the what type of, of, of soil do you have, what's in pest infestation. That's a, you know you have to do that kind of, of experimentation. And unfortunately, we are not providing that kind of of, uh, of support, and especially the kind of the, the 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 industry and the academic and research community linkages. Uh, in our case, is very weak, and I think that's as really. Uh, I've heard of some efforts to uh, recently to address those issues, but uh, I think we need to do more, and perhaps the government even uh, should facilitate the process. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, a question from Willie T10. His question is, how will PCC respond to the M&As that may happen as a result of those weaker firms being taken up by the bigger firms which may reduce competition? Yeah, again, how will yeah, that's, PCC yeah that's, that's related to the earlier question. On, uh, so this bigger firms yes. are solving smaller firms. Uh, uh, of course, uh, our, our take uh, in that is that uh, if the acquisition uh, involves uh, uh, efficiency, uh, involves improvement uh, that benefits not only the small, the small firms but uh, everyone else, uh, uh, then that should not be prohibited. But if the big firm uh, swallowed a small, a small firm because it doesn't want a potential rival, uh, or competitor, especially if the, comp if the small firms uh, promises to be very dynamic and efficient and uh, game changer, then uh, surely it makes a lot of difference for us in the way we look at the issue. Yes. Okay. Uh, from Ida Johnson, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for a good presentation. There's a need to open up and lure foreign investors for large businesses to survive. Though we also expect opportunistic takeovers, uh, like in March, the House has passed a bill allowing 100% ownership. It's difficult balancing act for PCC. Can private sector representation like MAP help to be, help and be a part, uh, say, of a committee to endorse, to take over, especially those involving industries important to our country? That's from Ida Chongson. Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, we, uh, uh, we, we are reaching out to, uh, to uh, associations uh, uh, like the MAP uh, for, uh, uh, for, for uh, collaboration, uh, cooperation in, the, uh, uh, in, in this whole uh, advocacy for uh, competition culture. Uh, now, uh, we have been, as part of our advocacy, quite um, active in the uh, uh, opening up of the economy to more uh, competition, in, including the entry of, uh, uh, of foreign equity. Uh, uh, we have, for example, uh, uh, been uh, uh, active in the uh, Public Services Act uh, that uh, is supposed to, uh, to, to um, uh, provide uh, greater scope for foreign equities to invest in, in uh, uh, services, public services. Uh, uh, we are also supporting the uh, liber retail, uh, liber retail trade liberalization. And, uh, but again, um, we, uh, in, in looking at this uh, um, investments uh, we look at, uh, at at the competition issue and the whole point of the exercise is to ensure that uh, uh, when, when uh, for, uh, foreign equities come in uh, they come in to uh, to expand the pie to help expand the pie and to ensure that uh, 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 competition is fostered um, and not uh, to, to become a, a uh, a, uh, a monopoly or uh, uh, or an entity that exercises uh, uh, market power for uh, even the small and uh, medium enterprises. Yeah. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, a question from Francis Monero, who I think is based in Cebu. His question is, do we have an update on the final resolution, whether Pogo is BPO. Uh, we don't cover that. Unfortunately, I don't know much about that. I don't know actually nothing. <laughs> I know nothing about about the regulation Do of uh, of uh, uh, BPOs. Uh, Pogos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To whom should that uh, question be but addressed? Because, uh, well, you know, uh, well, it's it's I suppose Pagor because it's the uh, Pagor is the. Uh, regulatory agency. Yeah, the agency that's uh, license, giving license to uh, uh, Pogos. Okay. Thank you. Uh, from an anon anonymous attendee, his question is, do we understand correctly that the PCC suspended the evaluation of m as that have not reached phase one review during the quarantine, the community quarantine, and how does the PCC plan to deal with potential backlogs to ensure transactions are not hampered and delayed, especially since some of these transactions that have been submitted to the PCC may add much needed FDIs which our country needs during this most difficult time? Yeah, we, we are very, thank you for that. We are very mindful of the, uh, of the role of PCC uh, in our effort and the government's effort to improve the investment climate uh, of uh, the Philippines, particularly in its ability to attract uh, invest, uh, investors. Uh, now, uh, as uh, I mentioned earlier, um, the we, uh, PCC had to comply with the um, uh, Bayanihan Act that, uh, that was passed by Congress and uh, it's also led to uh, uh, suspension uh, or interruption of, uh, of uh, certain processes, including 
uh, those that involves the reviews uh, and, uh, and enforcement proceedings of, of PCC. Uh, but uh, as I s s stated uh, earlier, uh, we have also now with the transition to this modified ECQ, we are now uh, sure. going back to uh, to the notification. We are now uh, entertaining uh, new notifications and. Uh, we are drafting actually a um, representation to uh, IATF uh, uh, we are recommending that, that uh, certain processes, uh, uh, especially those that uh, uh, impact on, on quasi-judicial bodies like us, um, and which uh, and processes that, that, that uh, may not necessarily uh, 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 go against the uh, health considerations of, of, of uh, uh, by any hand up on the AO30 uh, should be uh, allowed. And, and so hopefully uh, we will be able to uh, uh, move on and, and uh, able to perform the task that, uh, ahead of us. Thank you. From our former uh, MAP president, Riza Mantari, her question, uh, Chairman, is the Bainihan law gives the president wide ranging powers. What is the PCC's involvement in ensuring that favored parties do not corner markets or contracts? Yeah, the the Bainihan Act has a provision on, on cartels and monopolization and, uh, and uh, anti competitive. Uh, conduct uh, and um, of course so we find ourselves there um, uh, <clears throat> that's that's our mandate uh, and, uh, and, and and so we have been uh, during the crisis uh, um, in the early part of the crisis we have already uh, uh, written DTI uh, uh, secretary Mon Lopez for a greater uh, coordination of our efforts uh, uh, in uh, going after uh, potential violators of, or violators of, uh, uh, of the law. So we have been watching closely the, the, and monitoring the markets uh, despite the, uh, the uh, restrictions in mobility. That's good to know, uh, Mr. Chairman. From our former ambassador to the United States, Joey Crescia, his question is: It has been reported that the aviation industry has asked government for a bailout, but some lawmakers have expressed opposition. The aviation industry is so important to the economy, not just in terms of job creation, promoting trade and commerce, and people mobility. What would be your advice to Congress and the executive on this? Uh, well, I, the, the, I, I tried to uh, to cover that in my speech uh, today. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that I think that um, uh, we have to be to, to look at these uh, issues closely. And I guess the, the 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 point that I would like to to note is that uh, uh, those bailouts should not, even though they are uh, uh, responding to. Uh, short-term, near-term uh, considerations like uh, um, the firms going bankrupt or you need to, to, to protect jobs. Uh, we need to make sure that our response uh, will not even create a, a bigger problem in the future. Um, we have many of those in our uh, recent economic history where governments uh, get, uh, buy both so many firms and then eventually these firms uh, very few of them actually uh, succeeded. made it uh, succeeded. Uh, and uh, and th so th that's not only on the fiscal front, but I, uh, from our end, I am more worried about uh, uh, the competition issue. Uh, for example, um, if there are only, say, three firms in, a, uh, in an industry, industry. Uh, and one gets bankrupt and, and uh, one player uh, or, uh, uh, buys the firm, uh, so the concentration becomes uh, higher. Of course, it's, 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 um, 
is not ne uh, necessarily still uh, unnecessarily uh, uh, prohibitive, but uh, uh, again, uh, the, the issue is, are there, poten are there potential buyers uh, that in, in, in such a way that the competitive landscape in that industry will be preserved? So these are the kind of questions that a competition authority would, uh, would be looking at. Uh, an interesting question, Mr. Chairman, uh, anonymous attendee. Uh, how do you prevent China from engaging in predatory acquisition during the period of economic instability? Uh, well, you know, uh, uh, luckily, <laughs> luckily, our law actually uh, uh, includes uh, or covers foreign transactions, uh, acquisition of foreign firms of, uh, of, uh, 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 in the Philippines. So we, to the extent that they are uh, mandatorily notifiable, we should be able to uh, look at those uh, Transactions, but even if they are not not uh, mandatory, not notifiable, if they are parties, uh, there, in, there is information that uh, is uh, submitted to us that says that uh, that leads to uh, certain competition problems. Then uh, uh, we are mandated to to look at that. Incidentally, um, uh, the the competition authority in in China, the SAMR, and uh, and the, uh, the Philippine Competition Commission ha have actually signed a memorandum of agreement to coordinate in uh, prosecuting uh, uh, anti-competitive uh, anti uh, conduct uh, that affects both countries. Uh, so yeah. we haven't yet uh, tested that, but uh, <laughs> it's something that we can test uh, if uh, the time comes. Okay. That's good, Mr. Chairman. Uh, from Professor Potts Macaranas uh, from AIM and longtime MAP member, uh, his question is, home deliveries of food and groceries, medicines, etc., require use of transport facilities that may be concentrated in many cities. Any lessons from other developing countries? Uh, I guess if he's... Uh, asking that questions from a competition perspective of whether or not the, the yes. uh, competition concerns in the in, in the, uh, the in this uh, kind of business uh, we have had some issues as the public may know already about the grab for example has been a subject of uh, of uh, uh, reviews by us uh, and which until now uh, under a uh, undertaking uh, and we do uh, look at those uh, uh, kinds of business uh, that, uh, and if there are competition concerns there, for example, if there, are, um, um, there are exclusionary practices that are being uh, played uh, by a dominant player, uh, uh, then let us know. Okay. Uh, from Nerissa Reyes, can you provide us with uh, a list of M&A and insolvency list of companies? Is, yeah. is that information available? Yes, of course. All the uh, mergers and acquisitions that we have uh, approved, uh, decided on, are, are, are in our, our website. website. Yeah, it's, ah. Everything is in our website, our decisions, our... And, and a summary of uh, uh, for a, a for the past few years uh, is actually in our uh, annual report. Ah, okay. Uh, from another anonymous attendee, uh, in what ways does the COVID nineteen health strategy affect the competition environment? I guess uh, this probably refers to the uh, primarily the pharmaceutical companies and the drug stores. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, question. <laughs> question. Yes, yes. Uh, um, we have uh, 
uh, we have actually uh, undertaken a uh, some market studies uh, uh, market study and and the pharmaceutical uh, industry and industry trying to uh, to learn where uh, where the high prices in the in in drugs uh, are coming from and, and uh, yeah so uh, uh, we are there we, we, we uh, but if you know if the public knows of any information that uh, would help us um, uh, uh, without you know prosecuting cases uh, uh, let us know yeah okay uh Reposing question from Leah Francisco. Given the current crisis and lockdowns, don't you consider as anti-competitive and anti-business the government's recent pronouncement that employers need to shoulder the cost of COVID testing? Uh, um, I, I think that the, the that concern is uh, go, uh, goes beyond uh, competition uh, uh, lens uh, um, I think I, I don't know what the uh, concerns of uh, government but I, uh, I as, as an economist I can say uh, uh, that I can venture to say that given the so many uh, needs uh, of, of government right now uh, to address the this pandemic uh, any help from the private sector, especially those who can private afford to, to provide uh, you know, the uh, testing kits for their employees, I, I think would be very much, uh, it's uh, not only a favor of the government, but a favor of the country. We have a question from our MAP president uh, chairman. What happened to your petition in the Supreme Court to nullify PCAB's nationality requirement in its current licensing scheme for contractors in the construction industry. Uh, we um, the, the the our case there we, it's a uh, it's our submission is an amicus. No, we are not really a party to the to the case uh, to the case. No? Uh, uh, and I, I I we haven't heard about uh, any decision at the. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I am updated on the issue, but uh, so far as I know, I, uh, there's been no decision on the case. Okay. And another question from an anonymous attendee, Chair RC. During this time of crisis, we need to heal and recover as one. Would you consider instead allowing mergers to happen and then monitor their activities later on for any anti-competitive behavior or violation rather than stopping mergers from day one? Uh, I think the, the, the law is, uh, is there and um, the task of PCC is to implement it. Um, the law. So, yeah, and also, that's, this other consideration is, uh, uh, in reality, it's much harder to run after uh, uh, mergers that are, are, are problematic, uh, problematic in the sense that, you know, if they are, uh, are found uh, to, to be anti-competitive, uh, to, you know, to disentangle them. Uh, once it has, the, the transaction has been consummated, uh, and has uh, gone a long way, uh, so that uh, it's still much better to do it early. Uh, when uh, and, uh, and in our law, uh, consummation should not take place before the approval of uh, the Philippine Competition Commission. Yeah. Okay. From JJ Moreno, uh, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned earlier in our your presentation that you have waived certain requirements requirements or relax some rules during the enhanced community quarantine. Do we take it that it will revert back to the previous requirements after the ECQ is lifted? Or are you considering a new set of rules and requirements for the new normal? Yes, yes. Um, we have been, uh, we have to revise uh, 
uh, our rules to be so consistent the with uh, the proclamations of uh, the Garak government, especially uh, those that have to do with uh, health uh, and mobility issues, uh, because that affects our the way we can conduct our business. So uh, as we move to the GCQ from the modified ECQ, we expect to 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 see. Uh, um, another guide, set of guidelines to, to, uh, for the public. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's good to know. From Adrian Cristobal, uh, his question, Mr. Chairman, is PCC recognizes natural monopolies in quotation marks. What sectors or industries fall or can fall under that category of natural monopolies? I, 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 earlier, I mentioned that our geography is uh, is something very different from the yeah. uh, many yeah. uh, countries around us. You know, small islands like Batanes, uh, you could have natural monopolies there, and uh, uh, and, and 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 you can. Um, it, it's simply because the market size is is very small. Uh, the the uh, uh, natural monopolies are by definition arise because uh, the, the technology or the um, uh, 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 or the market, uh, the size of the market is so small relative to uh, to, to production processes that uh, that uh, allow for uh, low cost. Uh, so uh, um, where. Uh, Local economies are separated from uh, from the uh, land mass. Uh, for example, uh, Luzon and and, and Mindanao. Uh, is, you have all these high transaction costs, uh, transport costs, shipping costs, and that serve as barrier for uh, for uh, intermediation uh, for uh, for the, uh, linkages of, of markets, and that does serve the so makes some of those uh, firms or industries uh, characterized as a natural monopoly. Uh, so it, it, uh, it, it, in the case of, uh, of uh, our neighbors like uh, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, you know, where you have huge land mass, you can, you can have uh, a kind of big market, you can have uh, several players there, uh, for a, even for uh, a high, a, a, a tech, a, an industry that's uh, highly capital intensive, uh, which uh, uh, provides uh, an element of this uh, uh, natural monopoly. Um, Mr. Chairman, uh, this question is addressed to you, not as PCC chair, but as an economist. <laughs> what is your position on senior citizens, this is a favorite uh, among MAP members, most of whom are seniors, who are barred from leaving the residence. Do they not contribute to the economy and so should be allowed to leave the residences? This is a question from Roy Moreno. My, my personal uh, uh, view is that uh, demographics has changed. Um, our, our uh, you know, uh, average lifespan has, uh, has uh, increased uh, even for uh, not so rich countries. Uh, and um, uh, there's no evidence that uh, show that uh, in, uh, 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 someone who is age 50 is, uh, is brighter or can contribute um, uh, more to society than someone who is 60 or 65. Uh, I would like to believe that uh, there's, there's still is so much productive life uh, or years uh, after even uh, after even 65. Our uh, uh, compulsory retirement is 65, but I think with, uh, for example, in in Japan, uh, people age 80 or 70, they are encouraged to yeah, still very so to country to work and uh, and I can well personally for me, I cannot imagine retiring how. Uh, I'll probably die fast earlier than if I, <laughs> if I retire. So, uh, so Roy, uh, you have the chairman's answer to that, and you, we are one with you in that position that uh, 
senior citizens should not be discriminated against and we are still productive up to these things. Uh, another question, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is the PCC actively involved or consulted in various uh, charter change initiatives, particularly in the area of liberalizing protected industries? Yes, we are very much uh, um, actively engaged by members of Congress. Uh, we receive uh, invitations to comment on and uh, our priority bills. Uh, we have actually identified sectors that are of high priority for us. Um, for example, the, the telecom, transport, energy, uh, food, uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, is, uh, um, and uh, we engage Congress uh, quite actively. Uh, this we have actually an office that uh, is uh, looking, uh, monitoring the, uh, the bills uh, submitted in Congress and being, deliberation, uh, being deliberated in Congress so that we could uh, inject uh, a competition lens into those uh, bills. Our view is that uh, if you can uh, introduce competition lens into those uh, uh, laws, uh, then uh, uh, we, we would not need um, much of PCC in the future. Um, so yes, uh, we, we active, actively engage uh, with Congress and we, are, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, even uh, providing training programs for the staff of, uh, of uh, our legislators so that uh, when, uh, so they could assist their uh, uh, superiors in the crafting of uh, laws that are uh, sensitive to competition issues. Hello? Hello, Rex. Are you still in, Rex? Attorney Francis, take over. I think we lost Rex. Yeah. Okay. No. I thought he... <laughs> okay. Um, Chair, um, I think a recurring question from the business community is that uh, whether uh, the PCC will continue to process um, M&A transactions so during the MECQ. Uh, because the observation is when uh, things have slowed down, I understand that because of the general issuances of the government. But there are transactions that uh, involve cross-border transactions, no? M&As uh, originating abroad, uh, and there is a Philippine leg or Philippine component. And to the extent that the transactions are not uh, processed here in the Philippines, it delays offshore transactions. So, um, uh, um, some um, uh, entities who are part of that uh, global transactions uh, would like to know you whether you will give preference to, to those transactions with offshore components so as to avoid delaying the whole uh, the global transaction. Yeah, we are mindful of those uh, issues. Uh, uh, Actually, the, the, uh, in the new guidelines that was issued this week, uh, it's supposed to, uh, to address some of those concerns. Uh, okay. uh, for example, we now, uh, for those uh, uh, notifications that were uh, submitted uh, before uh, uh, the lockdown, they are, we, uh, our office is now trusting them, and we are now entertaining new notifications. So uh, hopefully the MECQ in in uh, Manila uh, will uh, will will sh the regime will shift to the GCQ uh, uh, the end of this month so that uh, we can proceed with uh, 
more in depth. Uh, okay. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, oh, I'm, yeah. I'm back. Uh, okay, Francis. Yep. Okay, no, no I, I thought, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, my, my battery ran out, so I'm back. Uh, we have a question from our former MAP President Perry Pe. Mr. Chairman, is PCC on work from home mode or do you have 50% workforce working on site? Are you still able to process applications during these times? Yes, uh, we have not uh, stopped. Uh, we are, even during the ECQ, we, uh, we were on work from home arrangements. Um, uh, we continue to receive uh, um, uh, or address uh, um, issues uh, that are sent by mail. Um, uh, but uh, as I said, uh, um, in compliance to the um, uh, regulations of, uh, of government, uh, we are uh, restricted uh, in our uh, uh, mobility. Uh, but uh, Last week, uh, the uh, uh, Civil Service Commission has issued already a, uh, a more comprehensive guidelines on, uh, on various uh, modalities of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, uh, of running the office, no? uh, including work from home and skeletal workforce, uh, a combination of um, alternatives. So. Uh, we are to, yeah, to answer that question, uh, we are back, uh, although we, there are still certain uh, uh, processes that uh, we are constrained not to do, uh, especially those involving uh, physical contacts uh, uh, with, uh, with parties, for example, uh, our uh, ability to, to uh, do investigation, field investigation, obviously is is uh, constrained um, because of this uh, 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 by any hand act. So, yeah. You're still operational. Uh, another, we... question, another question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what are the steps being taken by the PCC to help stimulate uh, the economy? I mean, what work can PCC contribute to ensure that we have as fast a recovery in the economy as possible? Uh, from our point of view, and my point of view in particular as, a, as an economist, is that um, the, um, our, uh, the way we respond to the crisis now, the policies and programs that we put in place will very much determine um, what the future will be uh, uh, in the sense of the speed of the recovery and the sustainability of, uh, of the growth uh, uh, if you get back to at least close to the uh, pre-pandemic uh, trajectory. Uh, so we have been, uh, we have been uh, active in that uh, uh, advocacy part ensuring that uh, what we have uh, as a st uh, economic stimulus program uh, uh, will be as pro-competitive as possible. Um, uh, and and, and um, uh, because from our experience um, yes. over the last uh, 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 three or four decades, uh, what we have seen is that crisis uh, can be opportunities, uh, could be missed opportunities uh, from the point of view of, of uh, policy reforms. So if we take advantage uh, of this crisis to put in place uh, policy reforms or programs that uh, we ensure um, durability of growth when it, that growth finally uh, comes back, uh, is there, and that uh, means that uh, uh, should, uh, our capacity to to, to achieve that uh, long-term goal, as uh, uh, mentioned about the Bayanian, uh, the uh, uh, ambition not in 2040. I, I, I'm still quite optimistic that this is just a uh, kind of a, a short-term. Uh, 
departure from uh, the long-term growth trajectory, but uh, there's no reason to believe that uh, uh, that uh, aspiration is, is no longer feasible. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairman, it's, it took us about 25 years to get this competition act uh, in place, and you've been implementing that in the last three years. Uh, are there areas of our competition law that you feel Congress should amend or repeal? And what are those areas uh, to make the uh, uh, PCC more effective and uh, so it can, it can uh, execute its mandate under the law? Uh, Congressman Kimbo actually filed a, a bill uh, amending the uh, she was former commissioner, right? Yes, yeah, she was a former commissioner, and she is obviously aware of what uh, some of the limitations of our, of our uh, law. Oh. And there are indeed some enforcement uh, limitations. Uh, uh, for example, even though as uh, the Supreme Court has already issued us a, an inspection order, uh, which now gives us more uh, uh, clarity and how we do down rates or inspections, um, some of us, uh, or, or at least the lawyers among us, uh, think that we uh, still need, we can do much more uh, looking at the various uh, provisions of the law. Uh, and then there are also issues about our ability to uh, maintain good people. Um, uh, and that has to do with, uh, with the structure of uh, salary and salary. Companies. but, uh, but uh, that's you know yeah. since i'm uh, we are currently the occupants of course it's not, it doesn't seem to be to look good that we are pursuing, pushing for this but moving forward uh, uh, this issue has to be addressed uh, and then the the uh, our uh, in our bill also uh, or in our law the uh, all our collections are actually remitted to the government. <laughs> Unlike many of the other agencies where they can, can keep, keep part some. Of it. Yes, yeah. yes. So, uh, in a way, it's, it's, uh, it's not incentive compatible because... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but um, there's, there are pros and cons uh, to that. And I initially, I, I, uh, I appreciated the, the, uh, the, the feature of the, of the law, but I, now I realize that you... That you Commission has to have some some ex, uh, extra resources for uh, building the capacity of its staff, uh, for training, for example, for scholarship, for uh, for uh, research, uh, for investigation. So I think if you have some some buffer that you can use that and it's not provided in our GAA, uh, uh, that that those, uh, would be useful. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what is your current headcount in PCC and do you think is that adequate number of uh, people to monitor the competition environment in this country? We have, uh, in, government initially gave us a, uh, 200 uh, plantilla items. Um, we, we have uh, now uh, filled up 170 of that. Uh, why 170? Oh, of course, we are, we are now actually more than uh, about 200 right now, including job orders and, and consultants. And the only reason we are not, not been able to fill that up, uh, that the remaining 30, is that number one, we have quite a significant turnover. Uh, so every uh, any, at any point in time, there is there is vacancy. Uh, uh, <laughs> and then the, the, the other one is that uh, the items there uh, are not, attractive enough and so we have not been able to use them for example attorney one attorney two uh, we want a we want lawyers who, who have some practices in the private sector for example so that they they should know business uh, and has have some some um, uh, experiences and, and those are the kind of people that uh, uh, i would prefer to to, to be um, uh, with the PCC, we have uh, a, a actual, uh, a, a actual experiences with, uh, uh, with the private sector. Uh, 
because after all, it's what we are regulating is the private sector. So <clears throat> we have uh, we have some more time left. There's one follow-up question from JJ Moreno. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we can imagine that your office can get pressures from interested parties of the transactions that you are reviewing. These parties can be both from large businesses and also from the government. How are you able to maintain focus and independence? Very tough question. Well, yeah, I would be untruthful if I say we don't get <laughs> pressures. <laughs> pressures. <laughs> uh, but uh, 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 in our work, uh, uh, we emphasize uh, uh, transparency. Uh, we are, we uh, um, uh, that uh, um, we need to be um, open. Uh, and uh, so, if there are there questions or concerns of people, uh, 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 we should be able to provide. Um, and, and also that uh, uh, we uh, make decisions on the basis of, of uh, the evidence we have. So I'm very particular about the evidence that we have. Uh, and so as we get pressure here, uh, here and there, uh, we just lay, uh, submit the, or show the evidence and discuss the evidence. And, and it, it's whether they believe it or not, then uh, it's up to, to these parties. But at least uh, they know that uh, uh, these decisions are not uh, based on considerations other than the merits of, of, of the case. And for so long as we remain consistent uh, in that particular uh, area, I think the credibility of the PCC should, uh, should remain strong. I, I have no more questions from the participants, Mr. Chairman, but I'd like to ask one question specifically to you. Uh, you are the father of Ambition 2040, and uh, it has been mandated by the president that all government agencies need to align their strategies for the long term uh, for the Dream Philippines 2040. Has PCC completed its own vision 2040 for PCC? That's 20 years from now, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. That's a very good point. I, I hope that the the, the, the view of the world will be different by then, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, but let me just point out that the uh, ambition at in 2040 is a multi-sectoral, uh, multi-party effort. Uh, yes, uh, it has really benefited from the participations of so many people, uh, including uh, uh, colleagues in in government, uh, colleagues in the academe, and many members of the private sector, CEOs, actually. Uh, were involved, uh, yes. participated, uh, and so it was really. A, uh, uh, I think that if there is anything that I've done that that, uh, that really satisfies me uh, in the way uh, uh, the rigor of that work, I think that's that, that's uh, the ambition in 2040. And I was just so pleased and and, and happy that uh, uh, the government. Uh, the present government decided to adapt it because when we were crafting that uh, ambition in 2040, um, uh, many people were actually skeptical, uh, <laughs> arguing that uh, that gover a new government will simply just uh, swipe it uh, away and will come up with its own uh, program, its own acronym. And I said, uh, and so we have to develop an approach that says, you know, it, who could argue if. Uh, Juan or Juana will say that this is my ambition in life and uh, I want politicians, leaders who could bring me there. So it doesn't matter what colors you have as you yes. must believe in that dream and you yes. uh, pursue it. So, it. so it, it did not bother me that, uh, that uh, 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 what politicians uh, would say. They can invi invent new acronyms or new things but as long as the elements of the of the, of the program the are there, then it should be uh, it should be okay. And yeah. and actually, that program, the ambition, nothing recognizes that there will be there are fields when we have some departures like this. Uh, and what we assume and uh, hope is that you know that we have a system that uh, there's uh, our system uh, allows us to bring to get back to uh, close close to where. Uh, 
where you they departed want to be. from. And, and so I think if the next government would think about the same thing, and it should be, uh, we should be able to uh, to reach that goal. It may be no, no longer be 2040, but uh, at least you get there, uh, close to there. One of my personal involvements, uh, Mr. Chairman, is the Institute for Solidarity in Asia. Yes, and that yes. is our public governance advocacy, ISA. And so we've worked with about 200 NGAs and LGUs and GOCCs. And all of them we have encouraged to develop their vision up to year 2040 to align with the government uh, projection of Dream Philippines 2040. And that has been very effective in many of these. What happened was that before they would only have a vision of up to the end of the term of the president. Mm -hmm. And we told them that is okay, but you can still go for uh, 2040 and then you have milestones for 2032, yeah. 2028 and 2022. Uh, yeah. So you have, an, you have a long, long term, 20 year horizon, but you cut it into milestones yeah. at the end of its presidency. But what makes your ambition 2040 interesting was that it transcends at least six administrations. Right, so yeah. it is not personality driven. And that was based on a pretty large, uh, large uh, number of people you interviewed. And to me, that is uh, one of your legacies of this country, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for that. Oh, thank you very much. I, get, I have to thank uh, my colleagues at NEDA and, <laughs> and yes. uh, many other people for the, uh, for the help. Including Secretary Pernia, who pushed for it yeah, yes, after your term. <laughs> and now that uh, Carl is there, I think I, I, uh, he should be able to push it further. Pursue that. Okay, good. So, uh, there are no more questions, uh, Mr. Uh, President. Uh, one thing I like about uh, online uh, conferences like this is you are very efficient. And so, uh, and there were a lot of questions and uh, we were all answered. So I, uh, I leave it to you to decide whether we should already finish this uh, dialogue with uh, Chairman Balisakan. What do you think, uh, President Francis? You're, 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 okay. Hello? You're okay, you're okay now. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rex. Thank you, Chair Arsi Balisakan. Uh, it has been a very informative, fruitful uh, presentation and exchange of ideas. I think a lot of issues uh, have been clarified. And uh, we're happy you know, that uh, you have really accepted uh, our invitation. Well, thank, uh, thank you, you very much. much. Keep well. Thank you so thank much. You, our, our I really members. enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank so you. Thank, thank you, thank you everyone, and thank sure. you for participating in our second online MAP GMM with Chairman Balisakan. Thank you, and good day to everyone.